Okay, you guys ready? So you guys made it back. Congratulations, that's good. It's wonderful. I see a lot of smiling faces and hopefully you enjoyed the ice cream social. But one thing before we get going is that we have the Physicians Family Network. I don't know if you know that's for family and significant others that can join. And there's some handouts here. So we'll have that at the front desk if you're interested in joining. I think they're their next uh, outing is going to, they're having a welcome picnic on Sunday, August 25th. So that'll be at, uh, at Cooper's Rock. So just, just for your, um, so you know. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker. This is Brad Hall. He's the executive medical director uh, for the West Virginia Medical Professionals Health Program. Professionals Health Program. He, he's an excellent lecturer. He's going to speak on um, physician well-being and uh, in the program that uh, West Virginia offers. You're really going to enjoy his lecture. So no further ado, Dr. Hall. Thank you. Thank you. So congratulations on the next chapter of your life. And you ought to see what I see from down here. Literally half the room is populated, but it's all up there. Uh, so <laughs> that's probably very fitting because I'm going to show you more of a movie than I am a PowerPoint. Uh, so don't sit and try to read the slides. Um, I'm here to help you all when you get ill. And no matter what happens in your future, if you get ill with mental illness or addiction, it does not have to be the end of your career. I run the Physician's Health Program for the state of West Virginia. Uh, I wear a lot of hats at a national and state level as well, but today we're going to focus on the physician health program and potentially impairing conditions. I have no specific conflicts to disclose with the exception of administering a physician education grant and, of course, all four of my grandchildren. I'm the no man, so the uh, daughters-in-laws are good at throwing me under the bus with the kids. We're going to talk about well-being in general, uh, burnout, wellness, resilience, potentially impairing conditions, some of the barriers to people like us getting help in the healthcare profession, some specific indicators of potential impairment, and a broad overview of the PHP model itself, which is essentially a gold standard of care for chronic disease management. And what you have to realize, it's all about the safety-sensitive occupation. There's many safety sensitive occupations, pilots you'll relate to, but people underestimate and kind of forget that healthcare workers are in a safety sensitive occupation that changes the standard that you're held to, not only in terms of your medical care, but also in terms of the administrative medicine that goes along with it with credentialing and licensure boards and having a license. And the reason is the size of the population that can be affected is pretty large. And the depth of damage that we can do to any one individual is also very significant. And the public puts a lot of trust in us. You know, you graduate from medical school, you get your license or get your degree, but that doesn't uh, guarantee you the right to practice medicine. The right to practice medicine is a privilege, and it's regulated by the licensure boards. We'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll talk about burnout, wellness, and resilience. And one of the things I want to point out is a very good read. It's not overly long, written by a friend of mine named Lee Lipsenthal. He's deceased now, but it's finding balance in the medical life, and it's talking about kind of getting a feel for who you are versus what you are. Uh, we get so enmeshed in training that we forget we're members of the human race, and we have a hard time separating those boundaries, and that can be a problem in the future. General health and well-being issues, and you hear a lot about burnout right now. Burnout is a, a great term in terms of getting national attention and getting healthcare workers help, but it also initially kind of implied that the problem uh, lied within the individual, and that's not necessarily true. ICD-10 codes now have actually recognized burnout as a diagnosis, and if you think about it, that means it implies that there's a host, both in the professional and environmental world. And doctors get unhappy, residents get unhappy, they get stressed, they can develop mental health, mental health issues, physical health issues, substance use disorders, and an end-stage finding is actually suicide. We'll talk some about that. But it's really about the dis-ease of humanness. All members of the human race do have a little bit of uncomfortableness as we navigate life on life terms. And that includes doctors too. And in that continuum of uncomfortableness or uh, life work integration being out of whack, it doesn't necessarily go in a linear fashion straight down through the list. It can jump all over the place just like a clock. It doesn't go from 1 to 12. You can have depression issues and try to commit suicide without being burned out and having addiction issues. So the PHP model can actually help anywhere in that continuum. And part of the issue in healthcare professionals is the stigma. 
there's a huge stigma with anybody with mental illness or addiction issues, but it's a little bit higher than the healthcare professional for multiple reasons. I'm sure many of you have went to work sick with the flu, whereas if you were seeing a patient, you would write them a slip and tell them to stay home and get well and take care of themselves. And the God complex where the pedestal comes out from under your feet, your friends and family are putting you on a pedestal asking you questions, and that starts in med school. And they're asking questions about things you don't really know the answer to. So people look up to you already. And the knowledge of all these illnesses is not protective. If anything, it's almost like an occupational hazard where knowledge of mental illness and addiction issues uh, gives you a false sense of being immune to those issues. And we don't get trained how to ask for help. We don't get trained who to ask. Uh, it's a lot better these days. When I was in training, we didn't learn that. And God forbid, if I learned how and who, I probably wouldn't have listened to anybody anyways. That's part of our personality. We didn't get where we're at by not having confidence in our own judgment. So it's all about the education that needs to occur. And as part of that wellness, it involves both the personal and the professional line, not one or the other, it's a both and. AMA study uh, at the Mayo Clinic in 2011, 2014, compared the burnout rates longitudinally over time of that three year span, and what they found that the burnout rates were actually higher for all specialties in 2014, with nearly a dozen increasing 10%. Now, there was a more recent study that came out that does show for the first time ever it dropped a little less than 50%. And burnout is the, hall, the hallmark is emotional exhaustion. If you think about the work you do with your patients every day, it's very draining. You're, you're very giving people or you wouldn't be in a profession. And that can actually just wear you out emotionally looking at some of the travesties that happen as a result of physical illness. And people can lose meaning at work and feel like they can't make a difference and, the, and losing their autonomy and not being effective. And that depersonalization that occurs, you know, sometimes I can remember being in an emergency room in training where you would describe a patient by his diagnosis with the chest pain in room three and that sore throat in room five. And we forget sometimes that these are people. So with greater than 50% of the doctors experiencing burnout, you know it's not just a problem at the individual level. It's a system problem. And what we need to do is to balance the demands and resources, both professionally and personally, for better outcomes to address the issue. And at a national level, this is being done by multiple organizations so that it's more of a global approach at both the professional and the personal level. We know that healthy physicians give better care. Patients will follow the recommendations better. They're more compliant. We have better attitudes at work. We have higher team functioning and much less turnover uh, if, if physicians are healthy. And there's also individual drivers. Uh, our personality of being type A perfectionistic, somewhat OCD control freaks, makes you a really good doctor, but it doesn't work out well in, in, in the human journey or with your family. We're really good at delaying gratification, and sometimes when we get unhappy, we can become very materialistic. And as you know, if a doc gets a new toy, a new computer, a new gun, new car, a new house, you know, trying to fix that internal hole with an external solution, and it doesn't work real well. And of course, there's environmental drivers that we're not going to talk lengthy about today. The, the buzzword for everybody is electronic medical records and, and, and a lot of complaints about that issue. Uh, but there's other issues in, in the environment that we can work on. And we're finding it's being done because there is a tension that develops between the, the professional and the practice environment. And the overlap is where we can make a difference. And it's all about the shared responsibility of systems and individuals, instead of just complaining, getting involved in the solution is the antidote uh, to, to make it better for all of us. And asking for help from colleagues and your superiors, uh, and approach it as a team approach. There's also individual wellness key targets. Just being aware of how you're doing and taking good care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and learning how to develop resilience and getting engaged in, in, in the solutions, uh, whether it's professional or personal, to make your life better. We need to recognize when we're stressed, you know, and take a break, take a time out, recognize we're fatigued and we're irritable, restless, irritable, discontent, and we get grumpy. And that's a pretty good sign that you're, you're, you're getting into your discomfort zone. And learning to take your own temperature. Everybody knows him. Looks good on the outside. He's a mess on the inside. And that's true for us, too. We have issues going on at home. People ask us how we're doing, and our answer is fine. We never tell the truth. The dog just died, and we'll go to work and say we're fine. That checking your own temperature relates to physically, like how are you doing sleeping? How's your appetite? How's your energy level? Are you exercising? 
bowel bladder function? How's your brain working? Are you sharp? Are you clear? Are you obsessively thinking about thinking, thinking about things that thinking won't change? And how's your emotions? Are you happy, sad, lonely, tired? If you don't stop for five minutes and kind of ask yourself these questions, us physicians are really good about just becoming a machine and working and we forget to check in with ourselves and see how we're doing. And we need to help each other do that. And spiritually, that's a whole nother uh, uh, issue that can be very beneficial for people. Everybody can have their own definition or pursuit of spirituality as individualized as the fingerprints on your finger. So when you're attending to self, you know, it's counterintuitive to think that the desire to escape the situation and avoid the stressful situations is actually the antidote, but it is. The way, the way to solve every problem is actually to get involved, to get involved in the solution and get engaged and learning to, to develop resilience. And that's the bounce back from difficult situations. There's a lot of stressors in life, both personally and professionally, and avoiding them and, and not dealing with them is not the solution. I can remember the first time I was second year resident and a 19 year old died in my arms as a result of a car wreck. And five minutes later, I was seeing a sore throat in another exam room. And I can remember all day thinking, we never stopped and talked about that. It was as if it never happened. We just kept on working. And we get kind of immune to some of those uh, difficult situations that can occur in the workplace. And we need to process those and bounce back from them. These are called the burnout busters. It's a number of sources that can help people uh, learn more about burnout and some of the uh, things that will, are very helpful relative to that issue. Now we're gonna talk about some potentially impairing conditions, primarily mental illness and addiction. And everybody knows that West Virginia is somewhat the epicenter of the prescription drug epidemic, but uniquely places us as the epicenter of the solution. And that applies to healthcare workers too. And it's all about the education, about addiction and the treatment works. It is available, it's uh, non-discriminatory. And professional health programs, which is what I run, are available, uh, access to care, and they work. And it needs to occur at all levels, medical students, residents, fellows, older physicians, but also the public, the parents and the children. Uh, Long-term education uh, of smoking over the years led to a decreased incidence of smoking in our children, but it was a longitudinal effect. And we're doing a lot, of, a lot of that stuff now, but we're trying to change a culture. And if you look at alcohol use today, it's millions of people. Some of them social, some of them binge drinkers, some of them have a big problem. How many of you all have ever had a regrettable social behavior while you're drinking? You wake up the next day and you didn't mean to do that. And that's normal to a degree, but for some people that can be a sign if it's repetitive that there could be a potentially problem in the future. If you look at the NSDUH data, you'll see that there's millions of people who have alcohol use disorders. And you all are in these numbers. This data does include healthcare professionals. And when you look at the prescription drug abuse, uh, you know, what's going on in the public relative to pain pills and heroin, which gets a lot of uh, attention. If you notice, heroin's actually a pretty low incidence on this list, but it gets a lot of attention. And I have had doctors refer to me after successful heroin overdoses. And same thing with substance use disorders. NSDUH data, there's millions of people that have them, age 12 or older, one in 25 adolescents, one in seven adults, and one in 16 adults, 26 or older, had an SUD in the past year. And you all are, again, in these numbers. Mental illness, the same thing. Millions of people are having acute mental illness, they're having serious medical illness, or maybe a major depressive episode from life events. And they coexist together. Substance use disorders and acute mental illnesses, they coexist. So we look at the app overlap, not just in the public, but in the work that I do our doctors often have a mental illness and addiction, and we, we, we deal with those together, and I'll uh, tell you more about that. So how do you recognize potential impairment? People are not walking around with a blinking light over their thumbs, I got a problem. As a matter of fact, they look good, they sound good, and they're usually your friends. About 10% of the people in this audience are gonna have a problem with addiction in their lifetime. We all know this, this guy on the right. First, the guy on the left is actually Sir William Halstead, in the late 1850s, got addicted to morphia and was practicing medicine. The first intervention I ever did at a restaurant after a doctor pharmacist had been hauled out of his house uh, was addicted to Adderall to get going. Opiates to keep going, he took benzos at nighttime, and he drank. He was living in a hotel, and what he said to me really caught my attention. He said, Dr. Hall, 
You don't understand. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm a pharmacist. I'm a doctor. He really believed that. Talking to him three months later, he described it as almost an out-of-body experience. He remembered the conversation. He could not recall the logical thinking he had at the time because free of substances, his brain was working differently. In reality, chemically dependent physicians are untreated and unrecognized and are working today seeing patients. Talk about illness versus impairment, just like diabetes. Diabetes is a potentially impairing condition to the kidneys, but it does not equate necessarily to impairment. It is potentially impairing, and the same thing with mental illness and addiction. Full-blown alcoholism does not equate to impairment. Illness is the existence of a di disease, whereas impairment is a functional classification that often occurs at later stages. So which one of these guys is depressed and he drinks at night to sleep? And which one is the alcoholic who's getting depressed? Because alcohol is a depressant. And how do you tell? These are equal opportunity illnesses, and they do not care about the initials after your name. Just like diabetes and cancer and hypertension, healthcare workers, doctors, residents, medical students, they can all experience the same incidence rate over these diseases. We define impairment as the inability to practice with reasonable skill and safety. And that also includes the definition excessive use or abuse of drugs, including alcohol. Historically, it's been around for a long time. In the 1950s, the Federation of State Medical Board actually called for model physician assistance programs. In the 70s, the AMA wrote a landmark, landmark article called The Sick Physician. Now, a whole lot of has happened since then. It involves the AMA and the Federation of State Medical Boards and the the Federation of State Physician Health Programs, of which I'm a member, and we are currently updating our guidelines to, to assist physician health programs to continue to do what they do. A lot of what we do involves addiction. And it's kind of hard to identify. It's easy in the post office after hours in the wintertime when there's an alcoholic passed out on the floor, or you walk down the street and you find a, a heroin addict overdosed with a needle in their arm. But that's not what you typically find at work, and unfortunately, we get little tip-offs at work, but we don't realize that it often progresses and needs some type of intervention. So what exactly is it? Kind of like diabetes and asthma. It's a chronic, incurable, and fatal disease, relapsing medical condition. The American Society of Addiction Medicine has a very nice, long definition that, that is worth accessing and reading. It's a couple pages long, but it's much more informative. I define it real simple. It's continuing uh, behavior despite negative consequences, and the hallmark what we call the four C's. They, they lose control, taking more medication as prescribed. You've ran into patients doing this already. That compulsion to use, the inability to cut down despite multiple quit attempts, and the continued use despite negative consequences. A repetitive DUI is a good example of that. And the cravings, which we'll talk about, which is basically an, an obsession uh, of how to get more and the obsession to use more. DSM-4 criteria defined addiction as abuse or dependence. In DSM-5, it changed. It took pretty much the same 11 criteria, modified them a little bit, but defined it more on a continuum, kind of like the same continuum that occurs from social usage to having a full-blown addiction problem. And those 11 criteria exclude, exclude the legal problems nowadays. They added the cravings, and it's defiled, defined as mild, moderate, or severe on this continuum. It's all about the dopamine. We're not going to talk about the neurotransmitters that, that occur in the brain, but it's actually pretty interesting. All drugs of abuse act through the neurotransmitter dopamine. And that dopamine uh, is common to all drugs with a lot of substances maybe activating different systems, such as the GABA system by alcohol. So when the dopamine is up, they feel good. When the dopamine is down, they feel bad. And I've had physicians that tell me they didn't have their stuff and they're kind of apathetic and amotivational on the couch, having a hard time getting motivated. And they get a dose of their stuff, whatever it is, and they're up getting a shower, balancing a checkbook, washing the dishes, going to work, catching up on their medical records. And it changes their perception of reality. Nothing changed in their life, but their perception of reality because of that chemical activity of the brain makes them experience life differently. Another way to talk about addiction, uh, and you can explain this to your family, friends, and even patients sometimes, it's somewhat primitive, but it works. If you look at the, the brain as an orange, 
and that outer layer of the brain is where we make decisions about good ideas or bad ideas. And then you have a much stronger primitive brain, which is the core uh, that makes decisions related to flight and fight and the survival mechanisms. Drugs of abuse act in that uh, primitive brain. We often call it the alligator brain. And when, when the alligator brain's in control, bad stuff happens. Doctors will violate their own ethics, their own values. They'll do things they would not normally do as a result of addiction and, and the hijacked brain that's overriding the executive function. So sometimes when you're trying to understand the addicted patient, it's kind of like trying to understand insane thinking with a sound mind, and it can't be done. We become very judgmental when we try to do that. What about the cravings? If I took a bag and put it over Dr. Vallejo's head right now, he'd probably be pretty good for 10, 20 seconds. And then he'd start acting pretty crazy trying to get his stuff. And he would actually probably do anything to get it. And that's kind of like the drugs. If you talk to rec recovering alcoholics or addicts, they feel like they're going to die without their stuff. And, and they'll do anything to get it. Another way to look at cravings for you ladies the, the, or parents, the, the love for your children. Uh, in particular with the ladies, chocolate. And for the guys, the drive for sex. But if you talk to a recovering person or even an addicted person, they will literally tell you they felt like they were going to die without their stuff. And they're not lying. So what happens is that social recreational usage that's fun and to a large degree normal in high school and college and medical school and residency, it can get worse and turn into a need to. That need to turns into a have to. Just to feel normal, these people have to continue their substances. And then bad things start happening. But they have lost the power of choice that the social user has. And using is no longer an option. And I put this in here so if anybody's listening to this uh, presentation and you're starting to wonder if what you're doing is a problem and you're thinking maybe you need to cut down, social users don't ask themselves that question. They know they don't have a problem. So if you're somebody in the room who's wondering if you need to cut down on what you're doing, you might want to try to cut down. And if you can't, call me. We can help. It does not have to be the end of your career. And what we know for sure is your own patients can't identify addiction and often mental illness in themselves. And doctors can't either. Their insight is not real good. And I'll talk to you more about that. So if you don't look for it, you're not going to find it. And what you think is an addict is not always an addict. They, they can look good on the outside. They can look bad on the outside. The guy on the right here is not the addict. So what they're doing is trying to change your brain chemistry with, uh, without even realizing it. And they will do anything to do that. And I can tell you story after story of the legal activity that doctors have gotten into. And everybody on the outside just looks and says it's a bad idea. But they had to get their stuff. And it's our job as physicians and ethical responsibility to be aware of each other's inability to practice medicine or our own and, and do something about it. And historically, our profession hadn't always been real good at looking out for each other. We're good at looking out for patients, but we don't always look out for each other real well. And that's changed in medicine, especially in the last 10 years, and it continues to change. But it starts with you all. There's various disorders of impairment, uh, alcohol use disorders and, and mental illness we talked about. There's other issues that are often outside the scope of the PHP. Um, but these all can be potentially impairing. And I always have this slide in here just to remind everybody of the CAGE questions and how useful they are. Uh, they're greater than 60% sensitive for alcohol use disorder. So I tell people, put them in your hip pocket, use them on your patients, but also talk to each other in these terms, and they're very helpful. Because unfortunately, when a doc is in the grip of addiction, they can't stop. There's a lot of conversations that have occurred, and a lot of the docs that I take care of Somebody sat down and had a conversation with them at some point in time and was kind of encouraging them to quit. And the conversation goes well, and, and it, that's where it ends until it resurfaces later. So just like your patients, doctors can't necessarily stop what they're doing. And we don't want them to stop here. A lot of people who intervene and have these discussions, don't. they want them to stop, but don't stop here because they don't know what to do with it. Well, we have a system in West Virginia, and all three medical schools are incredibly supportive. Uh, and responsible for my largest referent base for early career physicians with medical students and residents. So it doesn't have to be the end of your career, and we do have a system to help. The addicted physician often has late-stage disease. Uh, our personality is such that 
we define everything in life and our success is are we taking good care of our patients? And a lot of times with docs, the first thing they tell me is they never hurt a patient. Uh, that's the last place you're going to see anything when it comes to a, a symptomatic or potential impairment relative to addicted physicians. And so even small intrusions of the workplace need to be taken very seriously because as physicians, we're a little bit better and have a better support system to allow us to de delay detection. And if you look at the psychology of the physician, you know, those, those uh, perfectionistic type A traits I told you about earlier, I like to frame it kind of like I'm a hypersensitive, self-centered, big freaking baby, and I like to get my way. And it makes me hard to deal with. And I'm allowed to say that because I am one. I'm a doctor. But in reality, what we're doing is we want everybody to see ourselves the way we want them to see, and it's not necessarily accurate. Uh, that's true for the whole human race and the ego structure that we have. And we lie to ourselves. And if we don't have what I call adult supervision to help us see a little bit more clearly, often what we're projecting is not what's going on. And the reverse can be true. We can, all, we can look very good on the, or be very good on the outside, but inside feel very small. And medical specialties with addiction, none of them are immune. There are some that are particularly high risk, like anesthesiology and OBGYN, uh, emergency medicine, academic medicine. And there's these barriers that we'll talk about to, to detection. In, in, in West Virginia, uh, well, I'll tell you our stats at the end, we have our kind of own unique uh, combination that does parallel those other slides there. So part of the problem is the lack of education and concerning the true nature of addiction as a primary biogenic psychosocial disease. And a hallmark is denial, which I actually prefer to call delusional thinking uh, because denial implies they know what they're doing and a lot of times they don't. Uh, it's more like delusional thinking. And unfortunately, the knowledge that you get in your medical training about diseases and these par very powerful substances does not make you immune. And if anything, it's a kind of a risk factor because we get very comfortable with powerful substances and we underestimate the addictive potential and that it applies to you also. And we can't see ourselves as sick as, as doctors. We're not very good at that. And I'm sure every one of you went to class or did rotations when you were sick uh, when really if you were in any other occupation, you probably wouldn't. Have. So which one of these is bipolar? Which one is taking too many benzos? And which one's child died? How do you tell? If you don't ask, don't look, you won't be able to tell. And all these issues that show up in the workplace, it's just the tip of the iceberg. I had a doc referred to me for a plea employment positive for marijuana. Had been with the hospital for about 20 years, had no issues, never had a malpractice case, great reputation. He walked into my office with a foot drop. You know what the foot drop is, where they can't dorsiflex the, the ankle joint, and it's stuck, and he had a brace, and it was due to batch or past back surgery and nerve root damage. When I got to talking to him about it, found out that he's on oxycodone, 160 milligrams a day. And I asked him about any other medicine. He said, yeah, Xanax, six milligrams a day. Well, why are you on the Xanax? Well, I'm anxious. Well, why are you anxious? Well, I got depressed because my wife was cheating on the cheating on me with the carpenter was building our million dollar house while I'm working 24 shifts a month. This all started as a pre-employment marijuana. He also had a suicide attempt. Now I went to treatment, got off all those medications, was pain free, and he did very well, and ultimately got a divorce and is happy and healthy today. And he was also growing the marijuana in his basement because he didn't want to risk buying it on the street, so he had a rather elaborate setup. So my point is, there's always more to the story, and if it's showing up at work, some of the things that you can learn about will be eye-opening. And just like coronary artery disease or any other disease, we take care of the comorbidities too. We don't just bypass somebody and send them on their way. We deal with their diabetes, their hypertension, physical activity, smoking. Addiction's the same way. There's underlying issues, comorbid issues of psychiatric illness, physical illness, family of origin issues, codependency, and that's what we do in the PHP is take care of all these issues and they do very well. We'll talk about the statistics because they're all interrelated. Just like coronary artery disease, they cross-pollinate each other and can make an underlying illness a lot worse. And it really is all about addiction, but what's changing in our society and in the house of medicine is we're not just defining it as addiction uh, to certain substances. If you think about it, calling a, a, a diabetes outbreak, we don't blame it on the cupcakes. And addiction's the same way. It's not just a prescription medication. There's other things. 
and with our children and our youth, it's all about delaying exposure. There's a lot of studies out there, uh, particularly related to alcohol. The longer you can delay the exposure, the less incidence of alcoholism you have in the future due to the developing brain. But there's other issues of addiction. And I got a 25-year-old daughter, and just looking at the Internet and Facebook and the iPhone, I just have fun once in a while, just take it from her and watch her just go nuts for five minutes. Um, we get addicted to everything, gambling, food, sex, uh, continuous connectivity. Shoot, we even get addicted to our own opinions, thoughts, feelings, and beliefs to the point where we can't learn anything else. Suicide, another major issue in the general public. Uh, one in three adults who had serious thoughts of suicide made plans, and about one in eight of those had serious thoughts actually made a suicide attempt. And alcoholics are really good at it. They have 20 times the, the success rate. Guess who else is good? You all. About three of this entire class die every year of suicide at their own hand. They're good at it. They're good at hiding it. And when they make the decision, they do it quickly. And if you look at the risk factors, it's everything the PHP does. We deal with mental illness and addiction, developing support. Uh, there's other risk factors like family history. The barriers to accessing mental illness and addiction treatment is a huge risk factor. So the PHP is actually a suicide risk factor mitigator for providing access to some of these illnesses. You know, we can't change their family history, but we can do a lot of other things, including teaching life skills. You know, that life work balance that we talk about. I'll, I look at it and I say the balance is the wrong word. I don't think life work is ever balanced. It's like a seesaw. It's always one side's up and one side's down but we can look at life work integration. That we can do better. There was a study on physicians contemplating suicide out of the Colorado Physician Health Program, and what they found was there were multiple stressors outside of mental illness and addiction that contributed to the suicides or suicidal ideation. So what about the barriers to detection? Those barriers, uh, occur at the hospital level, the, uh, the society level, the family level, and whose domain is it to deal with these issues? Is it the hospital, the PHP, or the licensing board? And often we collaborate together. Uh, I may be working just with the hospital or just with the board or all three, but they all have different domains of responsibility, and part of our job is to help others uh, navigate the internal administrative process of these other areas. What we're shifting to is a pr primary prevention model, just like other diseases. Lectures like this, in order for early detection, where we can make a difference sooner without the long-term consequences, uh, rather than just at, at the time of uh, disease detection and following it longitudinally. And we often identify people in a potentially impaired stage, then we follow them over time. Get them healthy, get them happy, and get them on with their lives. West Virginia provides, by statute, confidential access to give us a call for discussion, evaluation, treatment, and monitoring. And I'll go into more detail about that in a little bit. So these barriers to detection uh, or getting assistance are truly deadly. Does anybody know the number one sign of an anesthesiologist who has a fentanyl addiction? Most common sign? Dead on the floor. They often get discovered at work. It's a very powerful substance. And historically, that leaves a bad taste in the mouth of the system when people die from this disease. Uh, and how many lives could be saved among healthcare professionals as a result of addiction and mental illness? Unfortunately, the insight of the patient is one of the difficult things to deal with. If you talk to a patient about their cancerous lump and they, they need to get an ultrasound and a needle aspiration and maybe partial surgery, lumpectomy, chemo, uh, you know, they're not real tickled, but they don't fight you on what's next. They typically are, when's my next appointment? When you talk to a doctor about mental illness or addiction, it's hard for them to see it. Everybody else around sees it, and it makes it very difficult. On the clinician's part, there's a lot that our colleagues don't know about people who have these problems and how, how best to intervene. And if you don't ask, you are not going to know. You guys get to know each other in the workplace. And when things are different, something's not right, reach out to each other and ask. And when they tell you the answer is fine, tell them that's not good enough. You want to hear more details, more, more words. Uh, because usually you're right. Something's up when you, when you get that feeling. And this conspiracy of silence is based on a multitude of factors, including denial, fear, 
pure-blooded ignorance, ambivalence, and miss. And as I said earlier, it's not really lying. It occurs at a subconscious level, and it's actually a defense mechanism. And one of the most difficult things is to get through that denial, is to get healthcare professionals in a cohort of their peers where they can relate to each other. It doesn't do a lot of good to go to IOP as a 40-year-old alcoholic with 18-year-old kids who didn't go to college. And it takes that cohort of peers. We don't put a horse in with a herd of cows. We don't put a cow in with a herd of horses. They don't relate to each other. And you know the answer your patients give you. It's always two beers. How much do you drink? Two beers. I had a doc that came to me for his two drinks at nighttime after having a positive breathalyzer at work. They had smelled alcohol on his breath. And he, his wife was very upset with me for accusing him of drinking more than two drinks because she was with him every night. She didn't know about the bottle of bourbon out in the garage. So when he would go out in the garage, he would just top off the glass. And so it never got empty. And on top of that, because he was having some stress and insomnia, uh, he was a very analytical kind of guy. He got a 250 ml beaker. And he measured out 250 mLs of bourbon and drank it in one half hour before he went to bed to help him sleep. And on top of that, when he went to work, he argued about the breathalyzer. And he kept saying it was out of calibration. And before it was all said and done, we figured out he's talking about his breathalyzer. He had a breathalyzer at home that he used before he went to work. And I asked him, it's the first time he ever thought of it. You can see his executive function kick in. I said, have it ever occurred to you that social drinkers don't use a breathalyzer before they go to work? And that was the first time it ever dawned on him. He ended up doing well, but he started out with two drinks. That denial is malignantly obstructive for doctors getting help. They cannot see the road they're on. Everybody on the outside looking in says, this is a bad idea, and, you're in a, and there's a bunch of trouble coming. They think it's the wife, it's the CEO, it's the program director, it's medical records, but no. It's everything but the guy in the mirror or their addiction issues. That fear is actually legitimate in terms of being worried about professional censure and the financial disarray, the interruption of uh, your career that can happen related to training or, or work. And on the observer's part, we all get taught to first do no harm. Uh, we also are very well aware of the financial disarray and the career disruption that can occur and potential sanctions from the workplace that can result if we interfere. And we as healthcare professionals can't, and can't stand the idea of being wrong. We want to make sure the reporter is reliable, not vindictive, some kind of uh, enemy or uh, uh, competitor. And I can tell you story after story of, of docs. One of them, I was trying to work with somebody for about two weeks before they got him to come, was an alcoholic that they were smelling alcohol in the breath. And I couldn't get him to intervene, sit down and have a talk and get me involved until he was intoxicated at work at 11 a.m. with the blood alcohol of 230. Now, if I'd have got to him two weeks before, it would have been a whole lot different. So we docs can't stand to be wrong. We want more data. We want a, uh, more time to make sure that this is actually correct. And unfortunately, sometimes we allow things to progress and get worse. We don't want to lose a friend. We don't want a lawsuit. Uh, we don't want physical harm. Uh, so we kind of enable the situation to continue sometimes. And what I tell people is that's false evidence appearing real. All those things are issues, but they're not as bad as you think. It's not Mount Everest. The way you climb Mount Everest is don't sit and stare at the top. You just take one step forward, and you'll get there. <clears throat> and I encourage all of you, I get two or three residents out of this uh, audience every year that end up with a DUI or some other issue. And what I want to tell you is help is there, and it does not have to end your career. I have this in here a second time for those of you who heard me have this slide the first time, now you got a glitch in your stomach. And just pay attention to the glitch. And if you got a glitch in your stomach, think about cutting down what you're doing. And if you can't, call me because we can help. What are some of the indicators of potential impairment? I call them the six eyes. And the first thing we need to do is start thinking differently. Look for it. Assume it's there. Assume you're going to have it in the workplace in a colleague, friend, family, or yourself. Because remember, these, these illnesses are non-discriminatory and they are potentially impairing, and that's what gets you trouble in the healthcare system. Because again, 
what's going on on the inside is, or what you see on the outside does not equate to what you see on the, or what's going on on the inside. And we as healthcare professionals are not very good at disclosing what's really going on, allowing ourselves to be human. We're at work with a vertical relationship. And at home or out there in the world, it's more horizontal. And I was married to a med surge nurse and I used to come out of training and residency and, and, and walk in the door and inadvertently start ordering her around with the same tone of behavior at work. And I got corrected real fast and reminded I'm just a husband at home. And you know what? I appreciated that because she was right. And I, I, did, I needed to shift from my professional role to the human role. And part of that is allowing myself to be human and have fears, anxieties, concerns, wants, needs, insecurities, just like the rest of the race, human race. Family history is a big risk factor for addiction, but again, how do you tell? I've had a number of brothers, uh, uh, addicted physicians that I talk to and actually bring in their siblings because they're a carpenter and they don't have addiction and they want to understand why. And it's just a totally different effect. And to hear these guys talk about the effects of opiates where you know, the carpenter gets sick to his stomach, feels nauseated, doesn't get any energy, just finds it depressing, won't even take cough syrup because of how bad it makes him feel. And the other one, he doesn't get snookered on the opiates, but he gets this incredible euphoria, this incredible energy that allows him to keep going and work long shifts and be more productive. And it's all about the family history, but not everybody's wired that way. There are about 10% of the population that substances just do something different. Those behavioral indicators are related to the irritability, irresponsibility, inaccessibility, inability, isolation, and incidentals. Often there's mood swings, mood swings in the workplace that are out of the ordinary, and it kind of makes somewhat volatile and different than what they're used to. They often can be very negative, just develop a negative attitude about everything. Uh, you know, I call it the silent scream sometimes when they're asking for help. They become very argumentative, and often with people they wouldn't need normally be argumentative with, like in positions of authority, like the program director. They become hypersensitive to criticism. And, and actual teaching. They may have verbal altercations with staff, family members over telephone, peers, or even patients. There may be other disruptive behaviors like throwing clipboards and, and things. And it's normal for somebody once in a while to get angry and have a little outburst. That's not what I'm talking about. All these signs and symptoms you need to think about in terms of an overall pattern. You don't latch on to any one of these and say somebody's potentially impaired. That's inappropriate, but the overall pattern of what you see, and in particular, a change from what you've been accustomed to, that personality change, and sometimes that can occur at work, like at lunch or bathroom breaks, where they get a dose of their stuff and a different person comes back. This is really easy to identify as not a good idea, right? And you'll see that in the workplace when you see uh, doctors challenging the CEO and the guy who writes their paycheck or the resident challenging the program director inappropriately. They may be trying to get out of work and shifting the workload, manipulating the, the schedule. And I'm not talking about appropriate requests that occur once in a while, but there are some patterns that can develop related to ER schedules or OR schedules, on-call duty. Sometimes they'll shift into start making lightning rounds, is what I call them, uh, which is outside the standard of what they normally operate with and taking shortcuts in orders or other uh, procedures that they may be doing in a hurry. Uh, to get done. They may be purely inaccessible. You can't find them. They're late for everything. Uh, they show up late and don't look good. They may have frequent absences from work, uh, often from different medical problems and doctor visits. Purely missing in action. You just you turn around, they're gone. And the, and the team's doing what the team does. They may make a lot of trips to the bathroom. Uh, trips to the parking lot. I've had a couple dogs get referred to me because they got caught drinking alcohol at lunch out in the car. Uh, now the staff have, had already had some uh, red flags and concerns and they just followed them. And long lunch breaks where they'll go out and get into their stuff at lunchtime and no longer eat with the crowd that they normally eat with. May not answer the pages like they used to. When they do, and you talk to them about not being available, they don't show up for the discussion sometimes. They have the same kind of uh, incredible excuses that patients have. Uh, things like the beeper failure, forgot to turn it on, the batteries were dead. These things happen, okay? They do happen, and, and a one-time occurrence does not equate to a problem. 
but it's the pattern that we're talking about. The frequent illnesses, particularly on Monday morning, you all have heard of the holiday heart over the weekend drinker. Well, Monday morning missing work uh, after a, a heavy drinking weekend or after a particular holiday. It's really easy to identify that he's not a whole lot of help to his patients at the moment, but they don't stand out like that in the workplace. They may be leaving work early, you know, particularly on Friday afternoon to get a head start on their drinking or before a holiday. Nodding off, uh, opiates a lot of times will make people nod off. And I'm not talking about the resident who's been on call and up all night and falls asleep in the morning. It's a pattern of nodding off out of, out of ordinary from what you become accustomed to in that individual. They may be writing their orders different, taking the shortcuts, you know, when you follow them up and you recognize that this isn't their typical work, charting inadequately, not being able to generate the same volume of patient care and charting that they're used to. Uh, on the hit list for the QA and the med records department, turning things in late. And again, it's about the change from what you've been accustomed to. They may have more difficulty with certain cases and procedures. You know, the gallbladder that normally takes 45 minutes uh, turns into an hour and 15 minutes over and over, uh, deviating from the standard protocol of what we're used to. And in the OR and operating staff for anesthesia, it's about the unwitnessed wasting and unusual amounts of sedatives used to anesthetize the patient, and the patient can be having uh, insufficient analgesia, uh, unusual amounts of breaking of the ampules that are used. Because unfortunately, docs that have a problem aren't walking around at work with a red circle around them. And if you don't look, even in this picture, it takes you five seconds to find that car that doesn't fit in. Their performance changes. Uh, I've had frequent forgetfulness and, and uh, colleagues recognizing that the individual's memory is like not what they're used to. Uh, there's a change in their sharpness and a number of those have been referred for, uh, you know, concerns of cognitive changes with age that ended up having uh, alcohol or excessive marijuana usage, uh, both of which can impair your ability uh, beyond the consumption stage. and with the strength of marijuana these days, that's high test. Uh, no wonder his brain doesn't work with, uh, on top of its game. I've had people that were noticed to be making rounds at one or two in the morning and with incredible energy and, and doing real well and on top of their game and they were avoiding making rounds when everybody else made the rounds. They quit hanging out where they normally hang out in the lounge or the, having lunch with everybody. Maybe avoiding departmental meetings, CME events that they used to go to or social events. And if you talk to these individuals, when I talk to them in my office, they really relate to the idea of feeling alone in a crowd. They literally feel alone in a crowd. And, and I've had docs that have heard this lecture, and it's one of the things that they would call me and talk about first right off the bat is I always felt alone in a crowd because they got a hole in their soul bigger than the Grand Canyon. They are unhappy. And they're just unhappy and don't know what to do about it. They can help everybody else. They can help all these patients. But looking in the mirror and helping themselves, they're not so good. Some of those other incidental findings that we talk about related to the eyes, ears, nose, other areas, you know, the red eyes that people talk about when you've been on a binge or uh, smoking marijuana, the black and blue from altercations and injuries that occur while people are drinking. Uh, sometimes people who are using excessive drugs will wind up in the same type of altercations. The jaundice and icterus that can occur as a result of alcohol or other liver problems related to drug usage. I've had docs that were literally intervened on making rounds because the nurse noticed that their eyes were jaundiced and they hadn't noticed. The puffy eyes, we all can get those. The, the glassy eyes, pinpoint pupils. And I don't mean just looking. If, you, if you're looking at pinpoint pupils, you want to compare to other people in the same lighting because uh, it's hard and different color eyes look different and it's hard to really judge. It's not like you walk around measuring everybody's pupils, but that can be a hallmark when you compare them to others. And the biggest one is no eye contact. These individuals often know that their eyes look funny and they have a real hard time looking at, looking at in the eye and it makes them very uncomfortable. They don't look good. You know, they go from being polished, well-shaven, dressed, makeup on, to over time, they just don't look good. And I'm not talking about showing up one morning after rounds and looking like you 
just crawled out of a meat grinder because you really probably did. Uh, but it's the overall pattern of, of just out of the ordinary in, in various settings not looking good. Alcoholics may have a tremor. I had a surgeon referred to me as a result of tremor about 3 in the afternoon. He started letting the physician assistant close his cases, and he would never let anybody do that. And he was recognizing that he had a tremor, and he started turning it over to the PA to close the case at the, at the very end. And that same physician, ultimately, in trying to medicate his tremors from alcohol withdrawal, uh, was using phenobarb. And he took too much, and he became impaired at work as a result of the phenobarb, trying to medicate the withdrawals of alcohol, and actually got referred to us because of the impairment of the phenobarb, and we discovered the alcohol was the problem. They may or may not have needle tracks. They're, they're going to be hard to see. You'll see sometimes in the wrong setting, uh, OR setting or elsewhere, where everybody's in short sleeves because they're hot, and they're wearing the long gown, the long sleeves. They may have heavy drinking. And remember, people drink sometimes to celebrate. That doesn't equate to a problem. But an overall pattern of being the guy on stage at the mic singing karaoke when nobody else is, is an attention getter. Off-duty intoxication can be normal social drinking, but it, it does not equate to a problem. But it gets your attention. The raspy voice of the often smoker drinker that occurs, uh, gargling in the bathroom. I had a physician referred to me who his drink of choice became alcohol-based mouthwash because he thought it was easier to hide. And he got detected because he got ototoxicity and uh, became legally blind as a result of the mouthwash uh, and was drinking it on a regular basis. You may hear complaints from staff, patients, and others. The slurred speech, and I'm not talking about 2 a.m. when the nurse calls and just got you out of bed, but there can be a pattern at inopportune times earlier in the evening or repetitive that's just out of the ordinary of what you're used to and, and the inability to track the conversation over the telephone like that individual normally would. They may talk openly about having blackouts. Uh, you know, the, the, the fatalistic comments that I talk about is the kind of silent scream asking for help and they, they actually talk kind of openly about wouldn't mind if they die their way out of this. The hospital gossip, you know, it's gossip. Uh, but, Second, third hand information is not real helpful, but there can be a pattern of things that you hear in the workplace that cumulatively over time do point to a problem. And then of course the nose, the, the WC Fields nose, the orange, orange peel nose, uh, often runny nose with chronic opiate usage. Um, you may hear or notice that they're chewing gum and, and drinking mint or eating mints all the time at work when they normally did not do that. Uh, alcohol on the breath. Alcohol in the breath in the workplace is a big deal. It's not from two beers the night before. You have to drink pretty heavy into the morning uh, or pretty late into the morning or pretty heavy the night before to actually have alcohol in the breath. So that's kind of a big deal. And I know sometimes uh, residents, medical students, college age, you'll have that. But a, a repetitive pattern of that is an attention getter because if you understand the metabolism of alcohol, it takes a good bit to have alcohol in the breath in the morning. The excuses that, that we've heard related to uh, prescription loss and animals ate their pills and ate the bottle, uh, treating or prescription from family members. I had one guy who, who was trying to convince me that his cat chewed the lid off a bottle and ate his pills, and it would have killed the cat if he ate the pills. I got Chesapeake Bay Retriever, so I just experimented, gave him one of them pill bottles, and it took him about five minutes to, to chew the lid off of it for a treat. But I seriously doubt the cat was able to do that. And there were a whole lot of other issues, but that was the sales pitch he made. A couple myths. People don't need to want help. People can get help even if they don't want it, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. But that happens a lot in the PHP, and they don't have to hit bottom. We raise the bottom. We, we can raise the bottom in a way that they can get an earlier intervention. What we know for sure is about 30% of physicians are going to have a condition that impacts their ability to practice medicine in their lifetime. That's kind of scary when you think about it. And addiction alone is 10 to 15% for multiple reasons. It's a little bit higher in a physician. So what about the other 70%, which is most of you all in this room? You are your brother's keeper. True story, a couple female residents got too drunk at the end of the year after they graduated and the driver's side front and rear passenger were killed in the wreck 
after they had called for designated drivers, their boyfriends. So the designated drivers drove them home. What they found post-mortem and in, in the emergency room, the blood alcohols were higher in the designated drivers than they were in the people who called for the designated drivers. So that's just how easy not looking for stuff, not double checking stuff uh, can happen. And the House of Medicine at a national level recognizes this. Uh, the AMA Physicians Health Program Act, uh, which, which I was involved with with the Federation in assisting some of the writing, talks about the importance of a physician health program, various components of that that are important legislatively wise. But the bottom line is they support wholeheartedly the confidentiality, the early detection of potentially impairing access, uh, potential impairing conditions, and making access to a safe system endorsing the PHP model that encouraged uh, healthcare professionals to come forward and get whatever help they need. So the bottom line when something happens is we want people to quietly in, uh, inquire to substantiate the authenticity. I get calls all the time. We don't overreact to anything. We don't underreact. We take things very seriously because the goal is to help arrange an intervention with our guidance and get them into the office uh, where I can interview them and talk to them and get my brain around the whole case and what do we need to do to help because the docs cannot see the position they're in. So it's kind of an educational event about the medical conditions and the internal administrative uh, process of other systems so that we can show them and give them hope that there is a solution to whatever the problem is. And those interventions is really educational and it occurs earlier in the stage of illness so it takes a little bit more convincing, but they work. And we don't lie to our docs. I don't sugarcoat things that tell them the truth, how it's going to work, how I see things happening, because if my docs aren't told the truth and they can't trust me, they won't tell me everything, and I'm going to give them bad advice based on half the facts, just like your patients do to you all the time. They don't always tell you. You know, there's so many, oh, by the ways, that occur when you're taking care of patients. Why do doctors use drugs? Everybody knows about the access to pharmaceuticals and the personality uh, factors and you know, socioeconomic status that kind of provides access sometimes. One of the big ones is self-medication of emotional and physical pain. And I had an orthopedic doctor, for example, broke his leg out west, had surgery, was placed on opiates, and came home two weeks later. And when he tried to get into his orthopedic doctor, who was out of town, he saw his family doctor, and he got two more weeks of, of Percocet. So when he saw the orthopod, he's now on four weeks of Percocet and was placed in a walking cast so he can go back to work. So he's taking per Percocet, walking cast, goes back to work. And now he's too busy. The world won't spin without him. He doesn't have time to deal with this. He starts having physical dependence, trying to get off the medicine he can't. And he ends up in my program a year later for diverting opiates for personal uses. That's how easy it can happen. Which one of these residents who's taking Adderall for ADD that they don't have is going to develop an addiction issue? About 20% of medical students are abusing residents. You all know that. Well, I'm an old guy. When I was in training, everybody called it retain it all. We didn't understand that much about addiction, but that stuff will help anybody think clearly and read clearly, but it can create a huge problem. And what we always want to remember is the last affected is the workplace. So there's a lot of issues going on in life, family, friends, financials, uh, before it ends up in the workplace. And certain drugs, it's very fast. Uh, with o, uh, OR meds and, and things like cocaine, uh, alcohol, uh, a lot slower. And again, to remind everybody that, you know, social use of mind and mood altering substances can be normal. And people do get intoxicated once in a while when they're celebrating something, but they, they do it in a healthy, responsible way, get Uber drivers, that type stuff. Uh, but an overall pattern uh, can be a problem. And it's not okay just because they say it's not happening while they're working. It will someday. And the on the job uh, alcohol on the breath is a big deal. It shouldn't be ignored. And their behavior and the things you see that are concerning, they'll come and go right before your eyes. You'll have a twinge one day and some worried about somebody's well-being, then all of a sudden they're fine and you go on about your business, and then there may be another twinge. And, this kind of a mood swing that occurs or something else at work, and it just kind of comes and goes right before your eyes. Take the time to talk to each other and, and see if they're okay. Because again, it's the overall pattern. Uh, any one of these signs or symptoms do not mean somebody has a problem. 
it takes time and it takes more objective data looking at the overall pattern of what you become accustomed to in that particular individual. Even the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about the benefit of following a case afterward where it's related to alcoholism. And really that's kind of what the PHP does. It all ties into the safety sensitive occupation which changes the rules. It changes the standard of care that healthcare professionals get because of that safety sensitive occupation and people forget that. Uh, we're just held to a different standard as healthcare workers. The, the fail first model of uh, chronic disease management doesn't work. You know how you, you get this level of care and if it doesn't work and you get this next level of care and a more expensive medicine? Well in healthcare professionals failures pretty quickly are career enders uh, and can also end your life. So that, that changes how we work and how we're allowed to work in order to provide care to patients. What the PHP doesn't do is we don't provide treatment. We have excellent treatment providers. I'm capable and qualified to do that, but if you think about it, that'd be a professional boundary to treat the people I'm monitoring and advocating for their well-being. It's not a place to hide. They don't just get to come in and, you know, we get accused of hiding bad doctors sometimes, and that's not true at all. They get good help, and actually, my docs are, are probably the cream of the crop. Anecdotally, they tend to be the top 10% of the class, the most productive resident, the CEO of the group. Uh, I've got a young daughter that, you know, I tell people if she ever needs surgery, I want one of my docs operating on her because I know he's okay. Uh, and I'm very comfortable with that. We can't tolerate unwillingness, dishonesty, or denial. When we work with referents, hospitals, licensure boards, we all have to be doing what we're supposed to do. Uh, in a way that our, our participants benefit. And we don't make decisions of impairment. We operate as if everybody's potentially impaired, and I can get people out of the practice of medicine in an hour with a conversation, whereas lawyers, it might take a couple of months to get somebody out of the practice of medicine. What the model is, really, is a chronic disease management through enhancing early detection, intervention, evaluation, treatment, and monitoring for healthcare professionals with potentially impairing conditions longitudinally over time. So we're with our docs for a period of time, up to five years for a, a full-blown substance use disorder, and we give them support, and they do very well. People get referred to us. I interview them, and often they get a comprehensive evaluation. A treatment plan is constructed, and then we monitor their compliance with that treatment plan, and they do very well. And then we can report on their well-being and compliance to your training programs, to the medical board, or anybody else involved with no private personal HIPAA information. In West Virginia, if the PHP says people are okay, the system is okay with that. They'll tell you, if you're okay with the PHP, you're okay with us, how can we help? And that allows better privacy for you all. I probably want to watch that again. If you think about it, dealing with you all and our healthcare population of physicians, it really is like trying to train a cat. And it's a very diff difficult population to work with. And I love talking to Dr. Vallejo and, and Clay Marsh and, and Dr. Ferrari because they make me feel better about my job because their job is to keep you all on track. And I only get about 1% of you all over time. It is a balancing act with what I do. Uh, working with organized medicine and particularly the licensure board, we're interested in the, the confidentiality and the treatment that occurs for our docs and addressing their illness. Whereas the licensure board's primary responsibility is public protection uh, and, and being very concerned about impaired practitioners and public safety. 
and the sanctions that can occur as a result of some of the insane behavior that happens with active addiction. And, and a lot of dogs are actually diagnosed as a result of the consequences of some of their activities that came to the board's attention before it did anybody else's. And it's all about the relationships that we build with organized medicine, in particular between our participants, the referent, licensed boards, and others. And it's all about listening, kind of like what you've all been doing today. Uh, you know, I had, my wife taught me this lesson. Listen to understand, not to reply. See, I'm the type when I'm listening, I'm planning my rebuttal and trying to figure out how to win the argument, and I don't hear a darn thing. But when I listen to understand, it changes how I understand my wife's perspective. Well, that's true with your patients, it's true with your friends, it's true with organized medicine, it's true with impaired practitioners. Because the most dangerous opinion I have is having the highest opinion of my own opinion, especially when I'm wrong. And I didn't know that. I had to get older before I started realizing that. Physicians have a right to treat their, to get the same help that their patients get every day. We're really good at that. We're not really good at that with each other. And this is my wife on the way to work. And there's actually truth to that. She is the administrator of the Physician's Health Program. Um, I've never had a doc get up in the morning and say, you know, I've been drinking and drugging for the last 10 years, just couldn't wait to call you, Dr. Hall. That's not how it works. They're not real tickled when they get to my office. We give them hope. We ask them to be compliant. Whether you want your job back, continue your training, or keep your license, your paycheck, it doesn't matter. If you're compliant, you get really good help. That hole in the soul we talked about earlier, here's the message. They get well, and they like recovery, and they like a better life-work integration. And it ends up being the best thing that ever happened to them. That's not where they start. When they start, they're all over the place, thinking about all kinds of different stuff that is not the problem. The wife is not the problem. It's the, the pint of bourbon you drink every night before bedtime. So our goal is to keep them between the white lines during these ups and downs of early recovery or whatever problem we're dealing with until they can keep themselves between the white lines. And we can get out of their life and they go on with their life and they take care of themselves. So in other words, that bad stuff creates a have to get help. Then they realize they need the help. They start understanding medically and then the help actually becomes fun. And they enjoy this healthier, happier life because they have regained the power of choice. And again, which one of these guys has dysthymia and the other one, his social use of marijuana has turned into a big problem, smoking high test in a state where there's medical marijuana. So we work collaboratively with medical boards, hospitals, and others on these various behaviors. But in West Virginia, you have to have a qualifying illness, a mental illness or addiction. Prior to the PHP, we had an ineffective system because docs love their independence. We abhor judgments and abhor making confrontations of each other. Employers need their revenue, groups need their partners, spouses need their spouses, families need their income, and docs are real quick to grab a, law, grab a lawyer and just go back to work. And unfortunately, medical boards have sanctions after the fact. So people can call us, and I get 50 to 100 calls a year, often anonymously, or somebody identifies themselves as a caller, but not the individual. And we help people try to navigate whatever it is they're navigating uh, to, to, to help them navigate their own system and potentially get them into our office. Why do what the PHP says? Because people get to maintain their confidentiality. They get to continue practice someday when they're cleared to do so. They get to continue their training. We're a uniquely special advocate for our participants because the system knows that if they're in the PHP, they're okay. They quit worrying about it because the model works. And the patient safety issue goes without saying. We do occasionally have to report people who are severely impaired or they're non-compliant with what they're supposed to do or treatment just doesn't work. And what happened when we developed this program in the first five years, we actually had over a thousand percent growth and over a 90 percent success rate based on being licensed, working sober, and doing well. And here you can see it in graphic form, but you all understand what a linear slope is. That's just a steady state of potentially impaired, ill professionals coming into the PHP over time. And I can show you that same graph for many other states. If you look at the research data relative to PHPs, it's pretty impressive. These are all older studies, 70s, 80s, and 90s, done by PHPs or treatment centers. 
But what you'll see across the board is a very high success rate, in excess of 80 to 100 percent, relative to being completely abstinent and doing well. The real hallmark study occurred in 2008, uh, published. We call it the Project Blueprint data, but it was two articles. There's a number of articles that spun off of that, and the Phase One article talked about how does the model work related to the detection, assessment, treatment, and monitoring. What they concluded is that they actually thought many parts of this model could be applied to the general population. So you can look at the PHP, it's kind of like the DUI drug court system on steroids. Uh, it is, and, and our docs do well. The phase two is where the data came from that's so impressive. 16 PHPs and a retrospective chart review of 904 patients. What they found is 78% of those had successful completion with no relapses at the end of five years. Of the 22% that relapsed, it was a one-time relapse. So they get to continue their PHP participation and continue their career. And if you add the two together, over 90% were doing well at the end of 7.2 years. So what they found was such programs seem to provide an appropriate combination of treatment, support, sanctions that manage addiction among physicians effectively. There's also a nurses uh, support program in West Virginia called Restore and the Pharmacy Recovery Network for Pharmacists. But these models, the FAA pilot model, also compares with similar statistics. The Colorado Physician Health Program did a malpractice study where they looked at uh, the, the malpractice history before, during, and after uh, PHP participation compared to non-participants. And what they found was after PHP participation, uh, the pattern uh, PHP participants actually had a 20% better risk factor uh, performance than non-PHP participants. And one of the relapse studies shows some of the underlying uh, motive for the five-year monitoring, but a lot of your relapses kind of peak at about three years, and then they can go down after that. Hospitals, unfortunately, were bearing a lot of the brunt to deal with these issues by themselves. Uh, they've got a lot of help nowadays. Uh, JCO is one of those who, jo the Joint Commission is who regulates some of the hospital stuff, and one of those is they do JCO screenings, and what they, uh, mandated, MS 11.01 .01 acknowledges that hospitals should have a separate process from the medical staff disciplinary process to deal with these issues. And they go on to say that it can actually be delegated to the physician's health program. Board consent orders is another issue. Uh, you guys may not know much about them, but any action taken against a licensee uh, by the board is done through a consent order. That consent order actually gets uh, filed at the National Practitioner's Data Bank. So what that translates into is if you have a board consent order, it will follow you forever. It's public information. So docs don't want consent orders, and they'll do anything to avoid it. And an example of that is a family practitioner, for example, who has a consent order, even if he's board certified, he won't be allowed to resit for his board certification until he completes that consent order. So you can see how that's a pretty big deterrent to doctors getting help, and the PHP is able to circumvent that by getting people in earlier so that the board doesn't have to deal with them. Because there are some train wrecks that are so bad, I cannot get these people back on track in their career. I may be able to get them healthy from their illness, but the consequences of the behavior that occurred as a result of addiction or some other professional boundary can be a career ender. We have dual roles. Our roles for the PHP is to protect the public by providing a successful method of rehabilitation. So what we do is we provide a successful method of rehabilitation that protects the public. In other words, one plus one is three. Those two goals work together. We've got all of organized medicine on our board of directors, each with their own personal agenda, such as the hospitals providing access to care, medical boards, uh, public safety, or the Medical Association's Brotherhood of Physicians. And all those organizations are there to support a successful mission for the PHP, and it works. Our legislation provides for the voluntary confidential assistance for doctors with mental illness or addiction. It allowed the PHP to exist and collaborate with the medical board on these issues. And our records are protected. Our records are protected by law. They're immune to subpoena. So people cannot get their internal records from the PHP if they go through a divorce or some other lawsuit. They can go direct to the provider, but they cannot get them from the PHP. 
and that protection and confidentiality is what allows docs to come forward. When docs renew their license in West Virginia, they're able to stay under the radar. If you're in the PHP, the question that asks about substance use treatment says if you're in the West Virginia Medical Professionals Health Program, you may mark no to the box. So the medical boards are endorsing this safe system and maintaining that confidentiality. My board of directors manages the business of the, the business, so to speak. We have a case management committee. My board of directors does not know the identity of my doctors. That's how protective we are. I have a case management committee that has all the right specialties and credentials and experience on it, but they also have about 130 years of personal experience relative to these issues, so they are uniquely qualified to help me take care of my docs. We serve physicians, podiatrists, and physician assistants, and those in training. We define our licensees as those to be licensed, so we have medical students and residents in the PHP as well. We recently renewed our agreements that outline our responsibilities and the board's responsibilities toward us for a period of five years. And those services are related to the qualifying illness of mental illness and addiction, but we deal with all these other issues related to stress burnout, sometimes professionalism, as part of these qualifying illnesses. If you look at the treatment outcome comparisons to those stats I told you earlier, it's not a whole lot different than other chronic diseases like asthma and diabetes if you just look at the relapse rate. Uh, how many of you all know a diabetic who's 100% compliant with their medication? And do you get mad at them if grandma eats birthday cake and ends up in the ER because her sugars are through the roof? Uh, these are chronic medical conditions, but the treatment works. Uh, especially with our model. Detox alone for the general public or doctors doesn't work. But that longitudinal follow-up with doctors is in excess of 90% at one year, and that carries over to the five years that we had talked about earlier. So we have an effective system in West Virginia where docs are allowed to come forward in an anonymous, confidential, and respectful manner. Yep, it can still be a train wreck, and they can still be derailed, but we can get them back on track, and they do very well. Because our goal is early detection, thorough assessment and evaluation, abstinence-based treatment, long-term monitoring and documentation of that without having to disclose excessive personal private HIPAA information. What we're really trying to do is protect you from you. You guys are really good decision makers until you get ill. And then your th best thinking that got you a seat in my office, uh, sometimes you're still trying to use and it doesn't work very well. So we work really hard to help our docs uh, develop better uh, group thinking, so to speak and we surround them with an incredibly supportive system of treatment providers, family, friends, the workplace. You guys are at an institution right now and all the medical schools are very supportive and you got supportive program directors and I've had multiple residents referred to me and they're all doing great. So I'm here to tell you if something happens in your future, call me, it doesn't have to end your career. There's other issues we have to navigate, whether it's the, the DEA or insurance payers, hospitals, uh, medical boards, very complex system that we help our doctors navigate. We don't get a vote on the rules, we just know how they work and we help our doctors navigate this. Because it's very difficult. Although they have that very supportive system, they still have life. You know, they're still spouses, they have parents, brothers, sons, and it's a lot and we help them through that. 25% of our participants right now are medical students and residents. And that's pretty much unheard of in, in, in the nation to have that many. 24 different specialties. About 85% of our participants are substance use disorder only. About half of our doctors have a DSM-5 psychiatric diagnosis coexisting with their addiction. And about 85% of our referrals right now are what we call self-referrals. They didn't come from the medical board. Uh, that anonymity and confidentiality has led to the, the board not needing to refer as many and people will bring their friends, family, colleagues forward. What do they like to do? Just like the public, they like to drink 40% of the time. About a third of them drink alcohol and take drugs, and only about six or only about a quarter of them take drugs alone. And when it is drugs, it's the same drugs that everybody else does: opiates, uh, benzos, or multiple substances. We have a little bit higher incidence of marijuana in West Virginia, but that's coming out of the medical students and residents. Um, last glitch, I promise. If you're having a glitch, think about what you're doing, and if you can't cut down, give me a call. I can help. There's a PHP almost in every state. There's uh, three right now that don't have them, uh, so it's very portable. It does not have to end your career or limit 
uh, where you can get further training or get a job. I tell my docs, you're not damaged goods. You're a, a member of the human race with a diagnosis, but within the PHP model, you can relocate uh, and it doesn't have to limit your career. We've had about 86% of ours return to work. A uh, number of ours uh, residents go on, get licenses and fellowships or get jobs, get licenses in other states without the data bank report. Remember the consent order I talked to you about? Within the PHP system, that confidentiality can help you navigate other state systems. So the model works really well because we have an ongoing relationship with our docs for a period of years. We're here to help. And the two boards in West Virginia work very well with, with the, the PHP to the, to the uh, impact that one PHP plus the two board has the effect of four. And we're both doing our jobs better. Because what we want people to remember is even small intrusions of the workplace should be taken very seriously. And there's a new message. In West Virginia, the message is rehabilitate, don't terminate. And, and West Virginia University, the Lewisburg School of Osteopathic Medicine and Joan C. Edwards School of Osteopathic Medicine is, is very supportive of successful rehabilitation. So we're going to continue the journey in West Virginia. So far, so good. Yes, we continue to grow. We continue to get more support, more referrals. Some of the lessons learned without getting into the excessive details, uh, basic line item that I like to highlight is we've changed the definition of recovery to five years in the PHP model. And I think we can apply that to the general public to some degree. What happens during that five years can be pretty variable, but we don't need to define success based on simple ab abstinence 100% of the time. And I'd openly invite all of you all to the Appalachian Addiction Prescription Drug Abuse Conference where it meets your CME criteria as required for licensure someday. It's going to be in Morgantown, October 16th and 19th. Uh, openly invite you all there. I want to wish you all luck in your careers and thank each and every one of you for who you are and what you do. And if you ever need anything, call. It doesn't have to be the end of your career. Thank you and good luck. So we do have some time. Any questions for Dr. Hall? Okay. You don't you don't get to leave till you ask one question. You don't have to. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh why don't everyone like just stand up and you know take a little break and then we'll get our next speaker in. So don't leave or hurry up back.